And this is a uh, single processing. Uh, we need to move this along, I guess. Let's get back to signal processing. There you go. Okay. Um, today's technology has uh, in, introduced a lot of digital processing. The computers are so fast now they can do sampling at a much, much higher rate than even the frequencies. Again, remember we're using 3 megahertz to 28 megahertz. 28 million cycles per second sounds like a lot, sounds like fast, but comparing it to what the computer could do, it's slow. So they can sample that wave quite a few times. But anyhow, we'll talk about essentially, uh, we, we've talked about single sideband. Again, that's voice or sound. The audio signals are usually, you know, we consider the audio bandwidth roughly 200 hertz to 3200 kilo or 3.2 kilohertz, 3 kilohertz bandwidth. That's voice, that's what we can hear good and understand. Uh, it goes into a transmitter, it's mixed with a carrier wave, results in this AM modulation that follows the signal, and it's broadcast out. On the receiving end, we receive it, we stick it into the receiver, the receiver extracts that modulated waveform and puts it into an amplifier, and there you go. So that's, that's basic of a um, transmitter receiver. And notice what I said here. We don't pay much attention to the carrier frequency here other than using that frequency, that carrier that's in here. Here it's being raised and lowered in an AM waveform that follows the audio energy here. So we end up with high power, no power, high power, no power, high power, no power. But it's operating at the rate of audio frequency so we can hear that sound. It's received as such, and then into the receiver, because we are tuned to that carrier frequency, then what we do is we extract, by using a detector, we extract the energy off the top of that. And that's what we're actually hearing, is the increase in power, the absence of power. Increase in power, absence in power. That's AM, or amplitude modulation. Okay. Or ancient modulation, as a lot of the kids want to call it today, so. <clears throat> Uh, CW, how does, a, how does a transmitter work? Here's a, an example of a simple CW, continuous wave transmitter. We have an oscillator. This oscillator is a circuit that's designed to generate a frequency. It can be a crystal, it can be an amplifier in feedback. You ever had an audio feedback in a PA system? That's an oscillator. It's in its inherent resonant frequency is the squeal that you get. Well, similar technique, that squeal is, goes into this particular driver. This is considered to be usually an amplifier. It's called a driver. It isolates the oscillator from the amplifier. And then you have a key that then keys the driver and keys the amplifier. So we end up with a little signal coming out of the oscillator, a little bit more signal, and then out of the power amplifier we have the energy that we're going to send to the antenna. We're keying both of these circuits. If, because if we don't, if we key just the power amplifier, there's enough leakage in the amplifier when it's off that you would actually have this little signal going out and then the loud, loud, loud signal going out. So you'd be hearing them both and it's, it's horrible code to try to copy because you, you can't tell where the signal starts and stops because when he goes to key up, you hear a weak signal. So. But anyhow, that's typically why that's done. But the oscillator is kind of the key. We don't have any trick questions on the FCC to bother with here, so let's go on to the next slide. Um, we end up with a, uh, uh, what are we doing here? We're doing another, this is a little bit fancier uh, example of that, where actually we still have our oscillator here, but we have a mixer. And this is going to be a uh, variable frequency compared to the CW on a fixed frequency. This can be varied. We've got a knob that will change the oscillation in that from one frequency to another frequency. Um, then we have a mixer. Now what's a mixer? A mixer is kind of a, uh, it's an interesting, it's a nonlinear device that takes two signals and it results in some indifference and the fundamental. So what's that mean? Let's put some numbers to it. We have an oscillator here of hypothetically three megahertz. We have a 
local oscillator of 7 megahertz. So we're going to get the uh, oscillator out here, or the, I should say this one, we're going to get the 3 megahertz. We're going to get 10 and, what did I say, 7 and 3, so, uh, what is it? Four. Four, there you go, 4 megahertz. So, and that's, by doing that now, now because we're only switching, and this is a fixed frequency here, by the way. So this, this can vary, say, 10 megahertz. That's our adjustment range, is just 10 megahertz. But we can make that 10 megahertz go to all these different bands, all these different frequencies, by varying this with a fixed frequency. And quite often, this in the older radios, this would be controlled by a capacitor that changed the frequency of it. And of course, the capacitors were not real stable because the capacitance would change with temperature, physical vibration. Uh, and these would be crystal controlled down here. So, so nowadays, these are controlled by a synthesizer. A computer chip is sitting there making these mixer frequencies. And then this is a fixed frequency, or there's two frequencies typically in most amateur radios now. And they'll use those two to actually give you the transmit frequency. Because you're getting the sum and difference, you want probably one of them. If we're working upper sideband, we want the sum. So this filter is going to be an upper sideband filter, and it filters out everything but the sum frequency. So you get your, in our case, our 10 megahertz frequency through here. It goes in the amplifier. And we are keying the amplifier only here. This is simplistic. In most real radios, the amplifier and the stage ahead of it is also keyed. Again, so there's no bleed through. Do we have any questions on? No, we don't on that one. Uh, this is the example of a modulation. OK, this is the important part, modulation. What's modulation? It's described as combining speech with an RF carrier. And this is a little tricky. Modulation applies to both AM, FM. AM, yeah. Modulation is, modulation is the act of putting speech on a carrier. It can also be the act of putting a digital data signal on a carrier. So, but that's the big thing. It's combining it with a carrier. <clears throat> It has, we have a modulator circuit here, and that can be on an AM, all the modulator circuit does in an AM, it acts as a variable gain control that follows the power of the audio frequency. It turns it up or turns it down, up or down. In an FM, it's going to vary the frequency, and we'll see that on the next slide here. Uh, they threw transverters in here. Um, I think they did that for this technician class. Uh, 70 centimeter transceivers, UHF transceivers, are relatively inexpensive. Uh, Multi-mode transceivers, like sideband and FM CW transceivers for VHF, are a little harder to find, a little more expensive. But if you wanted to operate up in the microwave, for example, the 24 gigahertz band, you know, you really wanted to play microwave communication from the top of two mountains. You could wave flags at each other, but you want to do it by radio, okay, you get a transverter. And this transverter then is a mixer into a box. It will mix the 24 gigahertz frequency down to 440 megahertz frequencies that you can listen to. Transverters, a lot of radios will have transverter outputs on them, and that's what they're there for. They're allowing you to use much higher frequencies. They're commonly used to work some of the satellite frequencies too. Uh, I don't know anyone in this community that's playing with transverters, so let's get rid of that slide. Uh, receivers are a little bit fancier. Um, they have the RF amplifier. We're going to amplify. Uh, a second, say again. Yeah, right. We're, actually, we're going to, and typically there'll be a bandpass filter in front of here, too. Uh, Better receivers will have a filter that will limit the band that you're receiving because they want to keep out all the energy. You don't want the local broadcast station coming in at 5,000 watts, which will overload this amplifier. So there's going to be a filter that keeps all that out of there, and it's, and it's a, it's a uh, band pass filter or, uh, for the receiver. The amplifier then will amplify it. Those are most often adjustable. 
we run into our friend the mixer again. Again, it's a nonlinear device. It's going to take the two signals. It's going to mix them together. It's going to give us a sum and a difference. And we're going to have an IF filter that's tuned to the frequencies that we want, the particular frequency. Amplify it again. We go into a product detector. A product detector is uh, similar to the nonlinear mixer. It works in a similar manner, uh, and it takes the amplitude off of the signal, and then we speech amplify it, and out it comes. We have a peak frequency oscillator. We'll talk about that here a little later, but that is designed. When you're receiving CW, you're getting carrier, no carrier, carrier, no carrier. In other words, there's an absence of signal between the Morse code characters, between each dit and da. All you'd hear, you'd only hear the carrier as it comes in. You really, you wouldn't hear the pitch of it. So the beat frequency oscillator, they'll adjust that slightly off. So that carrier coming in, and again, that's the carrier. This is like 450 kilohertz or 9 megahertz, depending upon the IF. You can't hear that. So what they do is they'll have this slightly off frequency from that. And the difference in the two will beat, and you'll hear the beat note. This is adjustable. Most hams like between 600 and 800 hertz for the sound of the Morse code. That's an important thing when you start to practice and you have software. That's the best way to do it. Computers, lots of programs available on computers now. Find a pitch you like and stay with it. Your radio can be adjusted to that pitch for you when you want to receive. Uh, RF preamplifier between the antenna and the receiver. That's going to be a question. You know, in our, you know, I don't know if they'll ask it, if, what is an RF amplifier or with a receiver, but that's, that's going to be one of the questions. So you're going to want to take a look at that. OK, next slide. Um, this talks a little bit about digital. I talked, uh, I mentioned that you know, this is a conventional analog signal that we're looking at here. And then the computer is going to sample it because it can take a look. It can actually measure the voltage coming in on that waveform. It could create a value, a, a binary value in memory. And so it has all these samples. And then when it goes to create the digital value or the output value, it actually creates that voltage. And then it creates the next voltage and the next voltage. So it gives you an approximation to that. In the strictest sense of the word, this signal will have audio distortion. If this was an audio sine wave, a good ear would determine that this has a little bit of distortion in it. But they would still know that it's an 800 cycle tone or a 1 kilohertz tone. They would recognize it as a A440 on a piano. They would hear it. They would hear it as a little distortion. So it, it comes into the category of good enough now. And the reason we accept this is we could do so much more processing on that signal later on using the power of the computer. Next slide. Characteristics of a CW signal. Well, I talked about the dits and the das. It's on and off carrier. And they make a point here that the CW signal has the narrowest bandwidth of any mode. When we talk about bandwidth, how much space on the band is it occupying? How much room do we need to convey our intelligence? It has the narrowest bandwidth. Approximately 150 hertz is required to transmit a CW cycle. Only 150 cycles. And you would say, why does it take that much? Because it's just a carrier. It's a pure frequency. Well, the frequency is pure, but the minute you turn it on and turn it off, yeah, there you get distortion because you're getting the products from that sudden transition off and on. You're getting these products. And that's what's being shown here. We have a chart. This is our carrier frequency. Most of the energy, as shown here, is right up there in the main signal. But the distortion, or the noise products, if you want to call them that, are spread out. So we're out here to like 300 hertz on either side. Now, what this means from a practical standpoint is these are still discernible if you're running high power, other stations are near you, they will hear this in the bandwidth. So if they're less than 150 hertz or less than 200 hertz away from you, they're likely to hear you. They'll hear that because the energy is still significant enough for your receiver. 
to pick it up. Receivers are much more sensitive today than they were in the past, and this can be uh, a, a bit of an exacerbated problem. If you get that kind of signal from someone else on the band when you're operating, move. Don't get into an argument about how wide he is and you know how bad this is and how bad that is. I, uh, um, I chewed out a guy on 80 meters one time because he was distorted, you know, four kilohertz up the band. And he came back and he was kind of apologetic and he says, well, I think everything's operating normally there. And I, I kind of groused at him a little bit and I went off and moved and then I realized I was having the same problem. I had, there's a radio, modern radios have a noise reducer. Noise reducers have a propensity to cause distortion from adjacent signals. So I was operating my radio incorrectly. He was so strong, I didn't need the noise. The noise reducer was on there because I'd used it from a previous QSO the night before. So my advice is when you run into that, yeah, go away from it. So <clears throat> uh, the sharp on and off interruptions, that's what we're talking about. Uh, that transition from on to off actually creates these harmonic and it's there. But the 150 hertz, yeah, that's going to be a test question. It's nice and narrow. We can get a lot of signals. An average voice channel is three kilohertz wide. So, you know, if you put everybody every 300 hertz, um, you put a whole lot of CW signals in one voice channel. And in fact, you'll find them that way, especially on uh, rare DX. Next slide. Sideband signals. Uh, this carries voice information, like we said. It's a form of amplitude modulation. Guys want to argue, no, sideband is sideband, AM is AM. Well, it's amplitude modulation. But you're only going to use one of the sidebands. Here's an AM signal represented here. This is AM single sideband. Oh, this is single AM suppressed carrier because they're not really showing any carrier unless they're pretending that's a carrier. Um, again, we have to have a carrier frequency to be able to put modulation on. So our carrier frequency is 28.4 megahertz here, and we're going to have voice energy going all the way up to 28.403. Remember I said 3 kilohertz voice energy, and we're 3 kilohertz down on this side. We're looking at both filters, both sidebands. That's because it went through a mixer. Remember I said a mixer generates the sum and the difference, so you're going to see both of them. Because we want to transmit only on upper side band on 10 meters, we're going to put the upper side band mode filter on, and it's going to filter out all the lower side band, mostly. So the single side band is like a subset of AM? It is. Okay. It's without the carrier, because we run single side band suppressed carrier. Okay. They forget to put that in there. We actually suppress the carrier, because you don't need the carrier. Remember I told you the carrier wasn't used? We were just looking at the amplitude change of the carrier. Right. We weren't looking at that frequency. So what we have here is an amplitude change without the carrier. So these little signals, this frequency, all these frequencies is the sum of the carrier energy and the sum of your voice energy that's being used to modulate it. And again, the mixer, the magic mixer, that nonlinear device, it gives you the sum and the difference. That's the two that we're interested in. It also gives you the fundamental through it, but we usually ignore that. Again, the side bands are created the same way. The switch is just different there. Now here's a, here's something interesting. This, is, this frequency here is 500, this example. So this is going to be 500 hertz. So it's, as you're going up, you can actually hear it go up in frequency by 500 hertz. But on the lower side band, if you come over here, it's below the carrier. So the, it's inverted. You see the speech energy is, is, is technically inverted in effect, so enough of that. Upper side bands usually used for 10 meters, VHF, uh, UHF, sideband communications, and of course everything above 40 meters normally. But that's by convention. There's no technology magic restricting it to upper side band only. And again, military commercial radios will be operating upper side band. And there's a lot of guys that operate military radios. Uh, on those bands. They're usually on for a short net just to play with the military radios or backpack radios in most cases. So they're not going to annoy you too much other than don't holler at them. You're on the wrong side band. I hear that all the time. The next slide. Uh, receiver incremental tuning. If you've ever run CB, you've seen the clarifier. Um, what that does is that slightly adjusts. 
Modern radios today are very, very accurate frequency-wise. So when you're tuned to 28.4, he's probably on 28.4 within tens of hertz. Both of you are probably within a few hertz. Um, if he's running an older radio, uh, he may be off by as much as 100 or 200 hertz. 100 hertz, human ear starts to say, yeah, he sounds a little Donald Ducky. That sounds a little funny. You know, so rather than getting on there and hollering at him, hey, you're off frequency, he may, he may be as close to the frequency as he can get. Uh, use your clarifier. Use your re, uh, RIT, receiver incremental tuning. You punch a button, you tune the knob. What that does is that changes that beat frequency oscillator, that local oscillator. It shifts your signal enough to where it's clear for you. You're, you leave your receive frequency where it's at. He's left his transmitting frequency where you're at. And he's probably done the same thing, too, because he is off frequency. He had to use his RIT. Now, there's a little bit of, you know, hams will holler, well, you're, you're not using the spectrum efficiently because you're both wider signals than you need to be. But come on, guys, 100 hertz. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so that's what they're talking about on a RIT. And that is a test question. It's used to change the pitch of the voice. The reason it changes the pitch is it's playing around with that local oscillator down there, or the BFO. Um, and supposedly there's something you can play there. <clears throat> Going the wrong way. Yep. Next slide. There's the... Yeah, there you go. Ah, uh, you didn't get the guts of it. Okay. Yeah. I got the guts on my stick. I did it the old-fashioned way. I downloaded it. <laughs> okay. What you're going to hear is a, a guy sounding a little Donald Ducky, and you'll play with the RIT receiver incremental tuning or clarifier, and he'll be able to bring that down to where his audio sounds normal. Let's move on. Um, characteristic of single sideband signals. We're going to talk about distortion here. This is kind of a thing. Distortions causes harmonics. It makes your signal much, much wider, and it's not a very good neighbor. Uh, and FCC has got a question about it. The effect of excessive microphone gain on single sideband transmission is distorted audio. Let's fall back a little bit and say, why would I have excessive gain? That's because I'm looking at my power meter. Single sideband signals, I told you, were suppressed carriers. So if you're not talking into the mic, you've got the transmit button pushed, the red light's on, but you're looking at your power meter, there's no energy. When you start to talk, you start to see power on your power meter because now you're seeing the modulation, that single sideband suppressed carrier, upper sideband modulation. You're seeing that modulation and you start to crank. You don't like the fact that you're only putting out 50 watts on a 100-watt radio, so you start turning that gain up. You keep turning it up and keep turning it up, and man, you're putting out 100 watts even when you're taking a breath. You're overdriving the transmitter, you're, and you're creating all kinds of distortion products. The radio can't. There's filters in the radio, but it can't take that distortion out, and you will have your neighbors hollering at you for certain. So... You want to watch your gain. There's something in the radio, this is a little off subject, but there's a compression. Compression will take your average energy and put a little more gain into it, and then you can actually get a little bit more average power out. Uh, but that's, again, HF radios. You don't normally find that on a, you know, FM and stuff. So don't overdrive the radio. The reason is, here's the normal. There's a good sine wave, nice sounding. It's a perfect uh, sign. But when we overdrive, we end up flat topping. And when we flat top these signals, these signals start to become more like a square wave. And square waves are, the scientific reason is a square wave is made up of an infinitesimal number of harmonics. In other words, it's made up, if you take one frequency and then double it and then double it and double it and double it and double it and double it, and double it you keep doing that, you end up with a square wave. So consequently, that wave has the characteristic of those harmonic frequencies. Well, 
Well, and you, you know, you get distortion out of it because that flat spot then actually causes, yeah, it's like turning up, uh, turning up a radio up way too high on the speakers and the speakers start going distorted. That's the effect you get. Okay, it's a, it's a distorted signal because it's being clipped and it can't make it through the amplifier stages properly. So you're getting all of these, this extra noise that's being generated because it's being turned into a square wave. But the big thing is, is excessive gain, distorted signal. Don't run the gain up, but your propensity is, how come I'm not doing, I have a 100 watt radio, how come isn't doing 100 watts? Well, you're lucky if it does 80 watts, good signal, so yeah. Keep going. Next slide. Uh, we talk about the characteristic, I mentioned the fact that we use three kilohertz bands. Uh, technician band, 28.490 uh, to 28.5. 0.5 is a band edge. The band keeps going. There's higher frequencies available, but the limit for a technician on sideband is 28.5. So if you know, I'm smart, three kilohertz down is 28.497. Okay, I'm gonna set my dial to 28.497 and I'm going to operate here because I know I'm not gonna put anything out higher than 28.5. Wrong. Those filters in the radios are not that accurate. If you do that, and there are hams that do that, there's a group on 80 meters every morning that consists on operating exactly three kilohertz low. They're out of band. They're up into above four megahertz, and there's military channels up above four megahertz, and the military guys have to move. It, you know, I listen to them, and they finally decide to heck with it, and they move because the 80 meter guys are tearing them up. So. Uh, the, that's point, pay attention to band edge, where you're at, um, and be aware that your radio filters may not be as sharp, your frequency may not be as accurate, and if you are caught without a band energy, and it may be just distortion out of there, they can't hear you, but they know it's you when they turn down. Um, you, if you have an official observer, or whatever the ARRL calls them now, you're likely to get a love letter for him saying, you were doing this wrong, please learn how to stop doing it wrong. So they have no power of law. It's just an official kind of like, yeah, this wasn't working quite as well as you think it was. So, next slide. <laughs> FM signals. Here's our favorite. That's where most of us are going to play if we're technician class or even we want to get on local repeaters. Um, what's the characteristic? The characteristic, we start out with a carrier wave, but what we're going to do is we're going to, rather than vary the amplitude or the power of that wave, we're going to vary the frequency. And it's shown here by a wide spacing, lower frequency, narrow space, high frequency. And as our modulation comes in, and again on FM, it's still modulation. Uh, as the voltage comes up, we're going to create a narrow signal here. And as the voltage goes down, we're going to create a much lower frequency than our resting frequency or our carrier. So we're going to swing that si signal plus or minus so many kilohertz from the carrier frequency. So that takes up more space in the bandwidth, though, correct? It can. We've gone with they've gone to something called narrow banding, which means they aren't changing this frequency as far okay. based on the energy. Uh, when I got into two-way radio work with a railroad, uh, we used 15 kilohertz deviation, which means you better stay about 30 kilohertz away. <laughs> uh, and uh, so and I, think, I think we even had radios that were wider than that back then. I think they had some 40 kilohertz radios for deviation. It was great sounding. You know, the, the, the engineers could yak with each other with high fidelity back and forth, but then talk to the switch yards and stuff. But it, uh, it definitely occupied a lot of bandwidth. But anyhow, that's the FM. Do we have any trick questions on here? Yeah, we do. Uh, the approximate bandwidth for a VHF repeater voice signals between 10 and 15 kilohertz. The deviation is not all of that, but that's energy that's out there, and most of the filters are there. Again, uh, we have been, you know, the commercial service have, have been narrow banded. The amateurs have not required to go to narrow band yet, but a lot of them will operate that way. Family radios will be narrow band. Yeah, FRS, so you won't get the full five kilohertz deviation that we're used to normally using. They'll use two and a half, so, so. 
that's plus and minus two and a half. So when you look at the occupied bandwidth, that's what you're starting to look at here. So uh, again, with distortion, test question, if you drive it overdrive, it'll get distorted. Too much energy going in for the modulating circuit to handle. Uh, yeah, <laughs> tuning a carrier above or below, you know, as you adjust it above, it's pretty hard in a lot of our synthesized radios, but if you get in there and step it up, uh, kilohertz or down, if you move off a kilohertz, you may actually improve the signal if it's somebody's repeater that's not quite on frequency, which isn't uncommon, uh, especially commercial. Uh, you know, things that you would think would be taken care of better but aren't necessarily on. Uh, so <clears throat> anyhow, um, let's see, turning above or below, we got that question. Uh, the advantage, the disadvantage of FM compared to sideband that only one signal can be heard of at a time. Sideband signals are, will mix in the radio. If you have two guys talking on the channel at the same time, you can hear them both, okay. equal energy. And you can probably just gurn what each one is trying to say, uh, at least sort it out. You know, if they're both trying to check into your net, giving you call signs, you might get both of them, if based on nothing more than maybe voice recognition. But a single sideband signal is audio, and it is detected as audio, and it goes in. FM has a feature, it's called capture effect, because of the way the discriminator or the detector, the detector in an FM radio is called a discriminator, it discriminates between different frequencies, and as the frequencies vary, it generates a varied voltage out, and that varied voltage, is it, if it varies at the rate that the frequency is changing, you end up generating the audio frequency. But this carrier, the, it can only track one carrier at a time and it will take the strongest one. It's called capture effect. So if two signals go into a receiver at the same time, the other carrier that is even only just slightly stronger will be the only one you hear. Occasionally they'll be so close together that you'll get distorted, somehow something's going on. You usually won't hear either one. That's rare. So capture effect. Next slide. Uh, modes, compare and bandwidth. CW is the narrowest. Single sideband is 3 kilohertz, AM is 6 kilohertz, FM 10 to 15 kilohertz. Why do we care about this? Because we only have so much real estate to play as hams. We are allocated a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, and we want to maximize our use of that spectrum. Next slide. Okay. There we go. Um, <clears throat> Okay, well, that's kind of a recap. You know, there's our, our simple, you know, AM transmitter here. And then we have a receiver that's effectively a AM receiver. It's got a product detector or a CW receiver with a VFO. Any questions, guys?